Okay, welcome to a review of advanced cardiac life support according to the American Heart Association. My name is Costas Alberis, and I'll coordinate ACLS and PALS training here at the University of Virginia. What we're going to do is talk about the algorithms, the cardiac arrest algorithm, the tachycardia and bradycardia algorithms. The cardiac arrest algorithm um, starts and more importantly is the recognition of, of cardiopulmonary arrest and the focus in should be is the things that we know that improve outcomes and have an impact on outcomes. There are a lot of things that we do in resuscitation that may or may not improve outcomes. So our focus should be uh, with the things that we know work. So for out of hospital cardiac arrest, we primarily see a lot of VF and pulseless VT, and that is due to acute coronary syndromes. That is the primary reason for that. So it's important to start CPR, whether it be a bystander, the initiative now is for dispatcher assisted CPR. And that, that's also important because if we know that if we don't start CPR within the first four minutes, that outcomes are very poor. So first, as we look at the rhythm, we see the rhythm is shockable, which means it's either V-fib or pulseless VTAC. We should deliver that first shock as soon as the defibrillator or the AED is available. So we don't want to delay CPR, but we also don't want to delay the shock. So we should start CPR if the AD is not available. If the AD is available and pads are on the patient, then we should immediately shock. After that first shock, we do CPR for two minutes, and we should try to not interrupt CPR. We know that interruptions in CPR increase mortality and uh, unfavorable outcomes. Once we get to the two minute mark, we evaluate the rhythm. Again, here there's no need to do a pulse check because we've already ascertained initially that the patient was pulseless and the rhythm persists if it is V-fib. If it happens to be VTAC, we do want to assess for a pulse because VTAC is potentially perfusing. So we identify the rhythm is now shockable. We deliver another shock and now we give consideration for epinephrine. The rationale behind administration of epinephrine in and around the second shock is that epinephrine could potentially be harmful if you've given it to a patient that has ROSC and a perfusing rhythm. So we're, once we verify that, that at the second shock interval that the patient has refractoriness, then uh, administration of epinephrine airway uh, management is indicated when you have folks that are available and uh, the expertise available as long as you're getting good bag valve mask ventilations, that's not essential. We should also include capnography as soon as possible. The advantages to managing the airway sooner than later definitively is that it allows us to do continuous chest compressions. We don't have to interrupt. We uh, evaluate the rhythm after uh, two more minutes and that rhythm continues to be shockable. We will shock it. And now is the consideration for amiodarone. And the rhythm now has been refractory to primary therapy, which is defibrillation. Amiodarone's dosing is 300 milligrams and we can give that IV push. And that uh, is the end of kind of the initial management of V-fib. We should continue on two minute cycles for defibrillation if the rhythm persists. And from here, there are multiple um, thoughts and interventions that may be a little bit different. And the AHA has no recommendation specifically to the interventions past this point. If the rhythm initially was not shockable, we get a no shock then, we're typically in the asystole or PEA algorithm here, we initially start CPR immediately and given epinephrine in this algorithm sooner than later seems to be of benefit. This is indeed the primary in hospital arrest rhythm. Once we start CPR, we should also very quickly start to consider treatable causes, the H's and the T's. Uh, as a result, CPR is buying us time. It's flattening the curve of, of kind of death curve if it would be, and therefore the sooner we can evaluate for treatable causes, then we can intervene, treat the underlying condition, and potentially have a better outcome. Next, we're going to go to tachycardia. Tachycardia um, can be uh, in several different types of tachycardia, whether it's a rapid AFib, SVT, VTAC, so we want to identify 
uh, the patient's uh, physiologic state, and we want to make sure that the tachycardia is not a physiologic origin. Uh, sinus tachycardia almost always is of physiologic nature and should not be managed as a cardiac condition. Uh, the difficult rhythm here, the most uh, challenging is probably AFib because these patients can have a very rapid AFib and it can have some physiologic manifestation. Um, and we'll leave that out of the discussion for now and we'll focus on SVT and VTAC. SVT being a narrow complex tachycardia and VTAC being the wide complex tachycardia. So what we're looking for is if the patient is symptomatic and stable, um, then we should give consideration to medical management of that patient. That is IV access, 12 lead EKG, vagal maneuvers. We should try to trend ourselves from least invasive to most invasive in our therapy. Adenosine is a drug that offers a chemical cardioversion and then we also can consider beta blockers or calcium channel blockers and expert consultation as this patient is hemodynamically stable. If the patient has the narrow complex rhythm and is unstable, i.e. they have an altered mental status, they have signs of shock, things that will uh, concern us and make them hemodynamically unstable, we should consider immediate synchronized cardioversion. If we have IV access and time allows, we can consider some sedation. Um, and cardioversion should be according to the manufacturer's recommendation for energy. Uh, the Zoll currently recommends starting narrow complex uh, defibrillation at 50 to 100 joules. And you can see the chart there on the right gives you some recommendations. Uh, there are very few monophasic devices in our uh, care network. And so we will almost always have a biphasic device. If the rhythm is a wide complex tachycardia, then you can note again whether it is stable or unstable. If it's stable, vagal maneuvers typically will not be helpful since it is below um, the AV node and therefore uh, we want to give a medication that slows conduction through the pathways. And that can be either procainamide or amiodarone. Amiodarone um, for preferences continues to be the first choice most of the time. We want to give that 150 milligrams over 10 minutes uh, in an IV drip format for stable wide complex tachycardia. And for unstable wide complex tachycardia, we again will go to cardioversion, but given that it's a ventricular rhythm, we may start at a higher energy level, uh, closer to 100 joules. There is one uh, nuance to this. And that is the HA allows for the use of administration of uh, denison to a wide complex tachycardia of unknown etiology. And that really is, if you say the words VTAC, then a denison should not be in that sentence or that consideration because you've diagnosed it as VTAC. If you don't know the potential that a denison could be helpful in a wide complex tachycardia of uh, etiology that is a uh, an SVT with an aberrant pathway, it may be helpful in that setting. However, it is also known that if you have polymorphism and any irregularity, that adenosin may be harmful and should not be given under those circumstances. Bradycardia. Again, here what we're assessing for is clinical condition and hemodynamic stability. Heart rate here says less than 50, can be less than 60, and certainly we want to put that in clinical. We want to contextualize that in clinical presentation and the patient's uh, physiologic state. Uh, with no symptoms or minimal symptoms, we can consider atropine, especially if the rhythm is a higher, um, is a more proximal block, first degree, second degree, type 1 although the AHA's position is that it is safe to give in all heart blocks that include, that involve bradycardia. If uh, the patient is symptomatic and unstable, we should give quick consideration to transcutaneous pacing or a dopamine infusion of two to 10 mics, as you can see in the box there, or an epinephrine infusion of two to 10 mics for the unstable patient. If the patient has 
uh, stability and you have the time, again, atropine is your drug that's indicated. A fluid bolus may be helpful also, and you have time to consider consultation. Uh, I would also be prepared for deterioration and the use of a more aggressive management in the patient condition.